Hi, um, my name is Eric Wing, and we're going to talk about Swift on Android. Android's a hard topic, so I have a lot of material to cover, so I want to make sure to cover the technical things that you will not find anywhere else. So this, um, why Swift on Android, I want to zip through and assume everybody here can imagine useful cases for having a cross-platform native language like Swift available on Android. Also, don't worry about keeping up reading everything on the slides as I go, especially those sitting in the back. I put extra things in my slides to help you in the future when you refer back to this talk. Also, I'm using the real Apple Swift. If you've heard of the REM object Silver Swift, this is not that. I've given talks about Android before, and I'm brutally honest about Android. While the experienced Android developers always thank me at the end for telling it as it is, People who are not familiar with Android development are in disbelief about how bad things can be and start to question my credentials. So I'm going to introduce my background to show you that I do know what I'm talking about. And I want you to know that I'm not just an Android developer, but I'm also a seasoned Cocoa developer, and I'm trying to bridge the worlds for this audience. I worked on a global satellite communication system called GlobalStar. It involved launching satellites into space with rockets. It's not relevant for this talk, but everyone says it sounds cool. I worked in cross-platform development during the end of the Unix wars and the peak of the Microsoft monopoly. Scientific visualization was a specialization I had. At the time, certain engineering niches needed high reliability, and Windows was too unstable. But all the Unix vendors were dying. Then a solution came with this new thing called Mac OS X, which promised a real Unix combined with a good GUI. Eventually, my work shifted from just porting to Mac to embracing Cocoa to create first-class UIs deeply integrated with OpenGL visualization systems. I got involved in some open source projects. It usually related to improving Apple platform support. You're going to see me mention SDL and CMake a few times in this talk, so I might as well introduce them now. SDL is the ultimate cross-platform foundation layer used heavily by the video game industry. It provides access to the graphic system, audio, input events, and pretty much anything you need to create a game or multimedia app. If you've played a cross-platform AAA game in the past 15 years, it is better than a coin flip that it uses SDL. Valve Steam has adopted SDL as a foundational component, so it's really important to the video game industry. CMake is a cross-platform meta build system. You list the files that you need to build in a text file, and CMake will generate native projects for it, like Visual Studio, Xcode, and Make Files. I wrote the world's first full-featured bridge between the Lua language and Cocoa. So I've used many low-level parts of the Objective-C runtime that most people don't even know exist. And I understand language bridging very well. I co-authored the book, Beginning iPhone Game Development, by, published by APRESS. I worked on some commercial game engines. I was the chief architect for the Corona SDK, which allowed people to write native cross-platform games in Lua. I later co-founded Lanica to build a game engine for Accelerator, so people could write native cross-platform games in JavaScript. Since Android development has so many problems, I inadvertently became an Android expert out of necessity. And as far as I know, I was the first to create a proper Swift Android app, the date on this first video is February 27, 2016. Ouroboros is an ancient symbol of a serpent or dragon eating itself. It represents an infinite cycle or something constantly recreating itself. With this talk, I hope to give you much more than just a checklist of things to do. I want you to see the fundamental concepts that allow everything to work. And the most fundamental concept that governs this entire talk is that nothing here is new. We are just reapplying old concepts in slightly different ways. So when we talk about the Swift compiler in native code, think about C compilers in native code. When we talk about Android, think about Unix and Linux. Seeing these analogies may help you understand how everything actually works. And maybe the most important fundamental that keeps reappearing in this talk is C. C makes everything possible. C is like the building block for everything else because it has some very special properties. C is the most portable language. Every platform has a C compiler. Even the web has a C compiler now. 
the C ABI is stable and everything is built on top of it. Almost all languages have a way to talk to C, and in Swift in particular, has one of the best. And there is a ton of software written in C, which all the other languages can use because they all know how to talk to C. So don't be surprised that C is going to reappear in this talk multiple times. So when we talk about using Swift on Android, or any other language for that matter, it is really helpful to separate the difference between the language and the libraries. Because when I talk about using Swift on Android, I do not mean using UIKit on Android. UIKit is a library, and one that is unlikely to ever be ported to Android. So I'm just talking about the language. Now there is this fuzzy area with the Swift standard libraries, which I boxed in yellow. You can see there are multiple libraries. Swift Core is the only one I call essential. It contains definitions for basic types we take for granted, like int, and I believe it contains the Swift runtime. The others are more optional. We'll visit them again later, but for this part of the talk, I want to emphasize we are just getting the base Swift language working on Android, and you don't need the rest to make fully capable, shippable apps with Swift. Here's an example. Imagine these apps are written in Swift, and all you must use Swift Core, but after that, each uses a different set of libraries. At the top is our native iOS app. It uses all the Swift standard libraries plus UIKit and Core Audio. Next, consider a native Android app written in Swift. This app uses the Swift C standard library, but there is no UIKit or Core Audio on Android, so for native Android, we would use the Android SDK and OpenSL ES. Finally, consider a native cross-platform game that goes to a whole bunch of platforms beyond Apple and Android, written in Swift. SDL provides us all the functionality we need. SDL even provides audio, but for symmetry, I decided to include OpenAL for 3D audio. I want to set up one more piece of context before we get into it. I care about making shippable, user-facing apps that would be deployed on an app store, not command line server apps. Fortunately, this crowd is mostly filled with Mac and iOS developers, so you know what I'm talking about. We must do a lot of extra things that others don't. All our resources and dependencies must be deployed with the app. We can't require users to install things. End users can't be expected to compile apps from source. I bring this up because these are the official instructions for using Swift on Android. There are four steps here. The last two steps are completely wrong because they're trying to build a command line app and install it and run it on Android. You iOS developers should be able to imagine how pointless and useless this is. It also masks a whole class of bugs because the environment and conditions this runs in is not like the normal Android environment. So we're gonna do things the right way. But first, I must introduce Android development. All real Android apps must be written using the Android SDK, which is in Java. Android originally was Java only, but had to cave to game developers, so they created the NDK, which lets developers create dynamic libraries in C and C++. But the NDK is the bare minimum they needed to do. So you still must create a normal Android SDK app and start in Java. You must use Java's load library to load the dy native dynamic libraries, and then use Java JNI to cross between languages. Just so I don't lose you, you might be asking how Swift fits in. Well, while the NDK was intended for C and C++, it is for all things related to native code, and Swift generates native code. So remember our Ouroboros serpent. There is nothing new here, just old concepts reapplied in a slightly different way. Now Swift becomes our stand-in for C and C++. Unfortunately, the Android NDK is awful. Legendary game developer John Carmack of Doom and Quake fame called it half-baked and says it really does suck. People like to remind me that Carmack has rarely complained about developer environments, even ones that were notoriously famous for being hard, such as the Sega Saturn. So this is damning. But this quote went viral because every NDK developer knows this pain. The NDK is a second-class citizen on Android with poor integration. The word on the street used to be that Google only has two full-time engineers working on the NDK. Why am I getting on Google's case? 
Well, Android is eight years old. They've ignored our pleas. Bug reports go into the void. Public ridicule is the only tool we have left. This is one of the richest, most powerful companies in the world with complete market share dominance in mobile. It is shameful. It is this bad. So I want to give you a taste of what it's like so you're prepared. Android does not use glibc. They wrote their own standard C library for Android called Bionic. It doesn't care about POSIX compliance. It doesn't even care about ANSI compliance. And eight years in the Android, it is still terrible. For those who don't know, Lua is an embeddable scripting language. It is renowned for how portable and clean its code base is. Lua has been built on everything. It doesn't resort to pound if defs everywhere for different platforms, but is a singular code base written in pure standards compliant ANSI C. To demonstrate how awesome the code base is, somebody built modern day Lua in Borland Turbo C 1.0 for MS DOS from 1990 without modifying the source. It built and ran successfully. What if we try this with the modern Android NDK? Build failure. This is a post from a Bionic engineer. I'm not picking on this engineer. This poor soul is trying to fix this mess. But this gives a lot of different insights into why Android is so awful. Let me read an excerpt. As you may be aware, Android's C library, Bionic, is a hybrid of code from different sources, Homegrown, FreeBSD, NetBSD, and OpenBSD. NetBSD files aren't from a single NetBSD release. Hell, they're not necessarily from any release. I found the bug that had been fixed in up upstream in like 1996, but we had some random old version of that file. In a prior project, I wrote a program to run a JavaScript conformance suite called Test262, which goes through 11,000 plus files. I used string lcopy in a hotspot. For a hot loop that should have taken 14 milliseconds, it took 9,000 milliseconds. On the SDK side, I was trying to get my list of 11,000 files inside a directory in the APK. Little did I know I walked right into a well-known Android performance bug. Pessimistically, this should take no more than a few seconds. Three hours later, I gave up and killed the process. Speaking of files, files that ship with your app are inside the APK. Think of it as a zip file. Well, you can't use the standard C library file functions like fopen and fread on anything in the APK. Google makes you use a different set of functions. On top of that, they require a parameter that comes from a god object from the Java Android activity or context class. This means existing cross-platform libraries won't work without special modification for Android. How many projects really want to do this? And it's ridiculous that this problem even exists. Android has a lot of wonky behavior and rules for dynamic libraries. I wish I had time to cover this in detail because a lot of things are affected by this. It is a common source of breakage and often leads to needing to specially modify cross-platform code. We'll cover one example in a few minutes with libicu, but another example I'm going to call out is the soname. Soname is a metadata field in dynamic libraries for the ELF, executable, and linker format, which is used on Linux systems and pretty much all Unix systems except Apple. There is a strong convention to put versioning information in the soname on Linux distributions combined with a series of symlinks. This will break on Android. Now I need to go one step deeper and talk about C++. Once upon a time, it was well known that you do not write libraries in C++, but I see a lack of library developers giving talks nowadays, and people seem to be forgetting these important lessons. I have to mention this because Swift uses C++. Swift itself is implemented in C++, and its standard libraries depend on the standard C++ library. Thus, the C++ fitpals are passed on to you. And with the Android NDK, these problems are much more apparent. The NDK provides five different C++ standard libraries you have to choose from. Choice is not a good thing here. All are incompatible with each other. Also, the C++ standard library does not guarantee a stable ABI, so every NDK upgrade potentially breaks things. If you use dynamic linking for your shared library of choice, you must bundle it with your app because Android does not ship a copy with the OS. 
This is in the contrast with, to Apple, which ships you one to spare you this mess. In the real world, people build library binaries and share them. But people don't upgrade their NDKs all at the same time, so versions get mixed. Also, people use multiple libraries, and each library could be built with a different NDK version. So you'd expect that the final application must include a copy of all these different C++ standard library versions that all your different libraries depend on. But Android doesn't name versions differently, so files will overwrite each other. Some of your libraries will start calling into the wrong version, and bad things happen. In contrast, Microsoft Visual Studio at least has the common sense to put version numbers in the file name to avoid this very problem. So, we should statically link, right? This is the warning that Android has in their documentation about static linking. So, it's lose-lose. Thanks for nothing, Google. In practice, I personally found static linking to be the better of the two. Unfortunately, modifying the Swift build system is really hard. I've successfully modified it in Swift 2 and submitted a patch, but the patch was never incorporated, and somebody upstream rebased, so the patch is broken now. So it's back to dynamic linking for now. So, now that I've given you a taste of Android, let's actually build Swift for Android. Now remember, we're application developers. The Android NDK provides almost no libraries, so we are responsible for building every library we need and shipping it with our app. I showed these instructions earlier and said this mostly works. But you need to know about this gotcha. This is an Android variation of DLL hell. The main dependency for Swift Core that we need is libicu, the international components for Unicode library, which is written in C++. ICU is a popular enough library that Android manufacturers, or Android itself, may use libicu internally. If used, when we try to load our ICU library with load library, the call silently does nothing because the operating system thinks it's already loaded. If we use the exact same version of ICU with the same build options, things will work, but ICU is notorious for breaking compatibility every version. Throw in Android fragmentation, and it is guaranteed that somebody will be running with a different version. So now that the versions don't match, when your code uses ICU, bad things start to happen. If you're lucky, you'll get a crash. So one way around this is statically link libICU. But if you must dynamically link, you should rename the libraries and the symbol names so they do not conflict with the version and the operating system. ICU has some compile time switches to help mangle names differently because they are at least aware of the problems caused by breaking compatibility all the time. You also need to disable soname versioning because libICU's build system is overly aggressive about setting it. So, good news. If we made it this far, we have a perfectly usable Swift for Android. Unfortunately, I need to skip foundation for time. It's not part of the official build yet, but this slide has a few notes on its dependencies. So now let's use Swift on Android. Earlier I said the official instructions were wrong. We're going to do it the right way. Remember, all Android apps must use the Android SDK, which is in Java. So we need to start in Java and work our way to Swift. So we need to create a proper Android Java app and follow the standard techniques to cross into the NDK. So we're going to start in Java, cross into C, and then cross into Swift. So we start in Java. On Android, every Android app must have an activity to start in. An activity is kind of like a window or a view controller, but not exactly that, but close enough for this talk's purposes. I've made this class my starting activity. I'm using the onCreate method as my starting point. You can think of it as init in Cocoa. Here we must load all dynamic libraries for Swift. Order matters, so we must load all the dependencies first, then Swift itself, and then our program, which we wrote in Swift. Remember, we cannot build normal executable files for Android, so everything we write must be built into a dynamic library so it can be called from Java. This is the same class as before, but I've hidden the onCreate method so we can see this. On start is roughly the equivalent to awake from nib or application did finish launching. 
In here, we want to call a native function that will get us to C. The mechanism that makes this work is Java JNI. JNI is well documented, so it just comes down to following a bunch of rules and boilerplate. In this example, I've declared that I promise to implement the function called myMainEntry in C. The native keyword tells Java that this will be a native function. The Java compiler is now trusting me to fulfill my promise of implementing it. I also just want to point out the package name declaration here because you'll see how it is used in a second. We are now in C. This is the implementation for that native function. Notice that the package name is part of the function name. This is just one of those rules of JNI. Now that we're in C, we just need to call into Swift. But how are we going to do that? I'm going to do a trick, but it's a trick based on old fundamentals. Let's call a function that looks like a C function, but is actually a Swift function behind the scenes. We'll call it my main. So finally, we're in Swift. And here's my Swift function. So how does this work? The trick is the at underscore C decal parameter. This tells the Swift compiler to make the function use C calling conventions so it can be called like any other C function. Also notice we declare the function as public. This makes sure the symbol is accessible to be called across the dynamic library boundary. So we just transformed and reduced the problem so it looks like C. So again, there is nothing new here. We just took our Swift ideas and transformed it to look like how we would solve it with C in the past. And now that we're in Swift, we can start having fun and write things in Swift. One more thing. You must never block the event loop. Since all of you are mostly Cocoa programmers, you know what this means. Android is event-driven like iOS. So you'll need to figure out how you want to use Swift in your app. You'll likely create more callbacks like this to call Swift for different events. Alternatively, you could spin off a background thread. However, I strongly discourage this unless you know exactly what you're in for. If you ever need to call system APIs from Swift, you're in for a world of pain from doing it from a background thread. This is like trying to write a full-featured Cocoa app from a background thread. You are asking for a lot of trouble. Here are some extra notes you can review later. For time, the main thing I want to remind you that is that there is no Objective-C runtime on Android. Here are more notes for you to review later. These items are self-explanatory except for the last one, which is be extremely careful about the initialization of static and global variables. In Android, these variables may not get reinitialized on subsequent launches. In this example, I have a global variable called g is init. It is initialized to false. You can see when we first run this program, the top block in the if-else gets run because our variable is false. We then set that variable to true. Now in Android, let's assume you actually exit the program with the back button, which is an Android difference compared to iOS. Now let's relaunch the program. Depending on whether Android purged all the NDK memory between runs or not, our global variable may or may not get reinitialized. If Android left this memory alone, when you relaunch the program, the dynamic library you loaded is actually still in memory. Google made the decision to not reload and reinitialize things. So in this case, even though this is a brand new start, our global variable is still set to true from the last run. So if we take the bottom block of the if-else, which is so we will take the bottom block of the if-else, which is probably not what we we're expecting, and wrong. This problem scares me the most because it is really subtle, and I don't know how far-reaching the implications of this are yet. For now, all I can recommend is that if you need this kind of pattern, try to design it in a way you can explicitly reinitialize your variables manually at start. As somebody who's done a lot of cross-platform work, this tweet really resonates with me. But I will add that even at just three different enough platforms, the build system differences are crippling. Take Xcode, Android Studio, and X, uh, Visual Studio as three of them. They are completely alien to one another. Build systems are the worst. 
while languages are standardized and cross-platform libraries at least try to minimize the differences, build systems are completely different and the platform vendors have no interest in minimizing the cross-platform pain. So how do you build your projects for Android? Well, there are three basic techniques. First, Swift Package Manager. Personally, I haven't found this useful. The main problem is that things we need to do with Android Studio are a far cry from what Swift Package Manager does. Second, you can do it yourself. Basically, you can string together the calls to the Swift compiler to build everything yourself. Look at what Xcode does and reproduce the commands. Obviously, this is a pain and it's hard to scale, especially as you need to maintain additional platforms. Finally, there is CMake. CMake is, a well is well used by cross-platform projects. Even LLVM, Clang, and Swift are using CMake internally. And surprisingly, Android recently announced they're supporting CMake as part of Android Studio. The thing that is good about CMake is that it already has a lot of support for each platform's native build process. For example, it can generate Xcode projects. But of course, since Swift is a new language, CMake doesn't know anything about it. So I started implementing support for it. My repo is on GitHub if you'd like to help. It's a work in progress, but there is enough to make shippable applications. This is a simple CMake script showing how to make a library or executable for Swift code. CMake script isn't going to win any beauty awards, but the CMake project generation capabilities are unparalleled. So finally, let's talk about libraries for writing Android apps. There are three major categories I think everybody wants to know about. So let's go one by one. Can we write native Android-only apps in Swift? Yes, kind of, but it isn't pleasant. As you saw earlier, we must go through JNI, which is very tedious. Furthermore, not everything is possible through JNI. For example, you cannot subclass through JNI, so you'll still need to write Java for those cases unless you resort to bytecode hacks or code generation. But again, there's nothing new here. JNI has been around for a long time. We know how to deal with it, and the world has come up with all sorts of solutions. But they all come down to the same basic ideas. You can write higher level libraries to encapsulate and hide all the JNI, so when you use the libraries, you don't have to touch JNI. Or you can develop code generation tools. While I'm not a huge fan of code generation because it often introduces new problems such as complex build systems, long build times, and application bloat, you can see a lot of high profile companies have resorted to this on Android. So moving beyond pure native Android, let's look at cross-platform libraries. Again, there's nothing new here. This has been solved many times over. Developers have been doing cross-platform for decades, especially by the video game industry. Basically, there's a C library for everything. And if there's a C library, we can use it with Swift. Here's a list of some of the usual suspects. SDL, OpenGL, OpenAL. FreeType does fonts. LibPNG and LibJPEG for your image needs. Curl for networking. Chipmunk even provides a physics engine in pure C. So there's already more than enough here to make full apps in, and in Swift on Android and any other platform you can think of. This is a Flappy Bird clone I wrote in Swift using SDL and company. I'm a Flappy Bird perfectionist, and most clones are pretty terrible, so I focus to get the tiny details right, even though I don't have time to prove it to you. And because our libraries already work cross-platform to everywhere, this program can work everywhere. This even runs at a smooth 60 frames per second on a Raspberry Pi. So what about GUIs? And let's start easy with non-native GUIs, ones that display the exact same thing no matter what platform you're on. My favorite is Nuclear with a K. It is pure C, so it can be used easily with Swift, and it has zero dependencies, so it is easy to drop into a project. It is also designed to be easy to adapt to any drawing toolkit. OpenGL is the most common, but it can be adapted to anything. Here's a pretty screenshot, a nice view of it running on Android. This is a particle designer I wrote for the desktop. One aspect I wanted to note is that these kinds of non-native GUIs scale linearly with your screen size. 
I intentionally made the widget small so I could fit more, so my design is not ideal on a phone. But it does work, and is surprisingly usable on an iPad or Android tablet. But I'm showing this to you to get to you to get you to think about your designs if you need to support a wide range of screens, like TVs to phones. But I know most of you are native developers. We know how much the native experience can matter to users and how much better it can be. So, is there a cross-platform solution to native GUI? I know everyone here wishes they could just take their Cocoa apps and recompile them everywhere else, but this is a really hard problem. If you look at history, there's a long list of serious attempts. Every one of these has failed to achieve the dream. If we look beyond Cocoa, we also see that there are very few actual native toolkits out there, and the ones that we can use with Swift are even fewer. But there is one I like called IUP or YUP. It originated as a research project from the same university in Brazil that created the Lua language, but it has since become a production quality library used in certain circles like the oil industry and scientific visualization. It uses true native widgets. It is also small and focused only on GUI. Most other libraries have become a massive kitchen sink, reinventing everything, and has tons of bloat. For us, this is a perfect fit because Foundation plus IUP has no overlap, just like Foundation plus UIKit. It is written in C, but is also written with language bindings in mind, so we can easily use it with Swift. It also comes with a textual layout description language called LED, separating code from data, and can be used for per-platform customized layouts. IUP's research roots were focused on how to deal with the wide variations between different platforms, not only in just the widget differences, but also in how not all platforms use object-oriented languages. It is very well thought out. Much of the API solution centers around a key value attribute system. Think NS user defaults. This allows API access to native features that may not exist on other all platforms without constantly breaking the API design, nor preventing you from accessing platform-specific features if you want them. While some people may not be able to look past the stringy API, basically this is protocol-oriented design at least as best can be done within C's weak type system. So I think there are amazing possibilities for a Swift wrapper for IUP. There's already been a lot of talk in the Swift community about what if we could have a GUI API designed around protocol-oriented design. Well, here's a hidden gem that just needs some polish. And the great news is that the Swift community has already developed lots of techniques to build nice wrappers. For example, see last year's Try Swift talk, Swift I for the stringly typed API. But as I said, every solution has its drawbacks. For IEP, it has native Windows, GDK2, GDK3, and Motif, but no Coco. But wait, I know Coco, and I'm speaking to a room filled with Coco experts. We can fix this. So I actually started. This is a screenshot from a real program I wrote. The screenshots are from Windows and Linux. This is a work in progress, but here it is actually running on Mac. So I know, I know, what about mobile? Well, we can fix that too. As I said, IEP is well designed. So much, in fact, I believe it can do mobile too. I don't have time to go into detail, but you can look up a YouTube presentation I made on this topic. But as a simple example, most other libraries made the mistake of modeling their APIs off existing desktop APIs, and everything is shoehorned into that, and we get things like a window API. In contrast, IEP created a more ambiguous dialog API. So while on the desktop, this may map to an actual window API, on mobile, we get to decide what makes sense. So how about for iOS, we map dialog to use UI navigation controller and view controllers, and on Android, we map it to activities. But talk is cheap, so let me show you something real. You don't need to understand this code, but I want you to know that this is a complete IUP program written in Swift. For clarity, I did not write any high-level Swift wrappers, so you are seeing everything. This program creates a dialog containing a button. When you press the button, it creates a new dialog with a button, and so forth. 
So here's the program running on Ubuntu Linux. This is the same program running on a Raspberry Pi. Now we're on Mac. Now let's do iOS. We are mapping dialog to use UI navigation controller and UI view controllers under the hood. And finally, Android. Here we map dialog to activity. Oh, one more thing. Surprise, Swift on Windows. So you just saw native GUI, cross-platform, desktop, and mobile with a single code base in Swift. If you'd like to help out, my repos are in GitHub. So this brings me to my current endeavor. As you can see, there is no magic in cross-platform, but there is a lot of tedious work involved. I'd like to make cross-platform native development more accessible to more people, so I created Blur SDK. I want you to leverage my experience in dealing with all the annoying platform-specific differences, so you can just focus on your core program. And I used Blur to help me create all the examples in this presentation. So Blur handles the build system challenges using CMake under the hood. Blur provides a bunch of deployment-ready pre built libraries so you can just build your app and ship it. And I try to provide a download and go experience for Blur itself. So this is the Blur workflow. Start it up, open your project, then you get the appropriate native project for the platform you're on, then you work on your code and you build and run. Currently I include libraries like SDL, so Blur is currently best for games and multimedia apps. but as you saw, I am very serious about IEP, so it is in development. Things are still young, but quite capable. I'm still nervous, but I want people to use this, so I'm opening up the beta today, so you can all start playing with it. I'm still trying to get off the ground, so I could really use your support. Also, I will be doing a game workshop at the Hackathon. There are still a few sign-up slots open, so I'd love to see you there. All these different le links will lead to me. Finally, I want to switch gears and say a few words about my friend, mentor, and former co-founder, Carlos Sacaza. He passed away unexpectedly this summer. While he was known by many different groups for different accomplishments, the Swift community knows him as at Coding and Swift. Apparently, there are 18,000 of you that followed him but he also held Swift meetups. This one was in Silicon Valley. He even managed to somehow get the elusive Chris Latner to show up that night. So that's why his Twitter channel suddenly went silent. I'm actually still at a loss for words even today. So I wanted to try to write something in his memory that would have special significance for events we shared together in some sense, this is a bucket list of things we wanted to achieve together, but time ran out. For example, he was an expert at splines. We wanted to do a spline project together, but it could never get a high enough priority. But for the rest of you, I also want, wanted to leave you with something that inspires you with how much is already possible with cross-platform Swift today. And, um, sorry. I have some demo issues. Let's see if this works.
Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Any questions? Uh, yeah, actually, um, right at the very beginning, I wondered uh, how bad is Apple in these respects and the same kind of fragmentation and not following standards? And um, not, it, it's pretty good, actually. So our rule of thumb, generally, in all the companies I've worked with, um, Android's about four to ten times harder. Thank goodness I can go back to bashing Android. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. How about the memory management difference between Swift, uh, Android platform and Swift? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the, question? the difference? My, the between, man, my management uh, difference? The platform difference between iOS and Mac platform and Android on, regarding memory management. Oh, memory management. Um, so here's the thing. So if you're in Swift, um, you're now using the NDK side of the memory, not the SDK side, unless you're calling into native widgets. Now, the funny thing about Android memory management is that the Java side is completely managed, and Google's actually done really stupid things, and they've um, imposed artificial memory limits for your Java apps. Well, the, uh, a long time ago, the, uh, the memory limits were just artificially insanely low, and nobody could write like real apps with it. So... The NDK people figured out if you do stuff on the NDK side, you can use all the memory that's on the device, and you, you're not those limits don't apply to you. And because Android's so bloated in general, they ship with more RAM than their iOS device. So you actually generally get more memory with um, Android than you do with iOS. Uh, 